uh, the chat. There's just a chat, uh, a chat button if you open it up. And so if I say, you know, if I type something, it should start flashing. Ah, got it. Okay. Very good. Sweet. Okay. So as I was putting this together, I, I was realizing that we've been, I've known you for about eight years and we've been working together for about seven and that's uh, longer than I had expected <laughs> when oh, I put thanks. this together. <laughs> and the story about Dave's Calerpa test that he took, it's, it, it tests really for like the most minimal competence of identifying this one kind of algae. And he thought that he had to identify everything, the species. So he was really sweating bullets trying to identify all of these exotic <laughs> algae. And uh, uh, it was awfully humorous to see his relief when he found out it was just the most minimal amount of competence uh, <laughs> that, that he easily passed. Um, so anyway, as Dave mentioned, uh, I work at a small uh, marine research group called Powell Marine Research. And I've been working there for about three years. Um, primarily on abalone recovery, uh, recovery of uh, listed rockfish up in Puget Sound, but also uh, habitat restoration, particularly eelgrass um, out, out of the Channel Islands and in Santa Monica Bay. And I'm going to talk mostly about the abalone today, but before we get into that, I want to go over a little bit about the career path I took. Dave said it might be helpful to share with you guys uh, the general outline of how I uh, arrived at this uh, position. And it's, it's a little bit awkward to talk about that because usually when you hear people give that kind of presentation, they're, I don't know, like the pre maybe not this president, but a former president of the United States or some really high up professor or something. And, and certainly that's not me, uh, but I am lucky enough to count things underwater and make a living out of it. So um, if that's of interest to you, then perhaps my career path will be useful. Um, and also, before we get into talking about the Apple, and I want to go over some terminology, just, it, it's likely a review for you guys, but just to make sure if I, I when I mention it, um, that you guys are uh, comfortable with it. So if, if you guys are thinking, and I'm assuming you are at least a little bit thinking about going into a career in marine science, I think you've already kind of crossed the form of a Rubicon here, but you, you need to really question why you're doing it because there are some absolute downfalls to it. The first is you're not gonna be playing with dolphins all day, which is mostly fine because dolphins are totally overrated uh, and they're not actually smiling. So this will not be you. This person right here, that's not gonna be you. Uh, the next is that you're, unless you're dirty, you're not gonna be making a lot of money. So you will not be swimming in Scrooge McDuck piles of gold. Um, it can also be incredibly depressing. There are large intractable problems that you have very little control over. Uh, example here is, is climate change. You get to basically get a front row seat to dramatic changes in the ecosystems that you care about uh, that are beyond your, your capability to do anything about. So you just kind of have to do your best and, and not despair uh, as much as you might be tempted to. And, and finally, we live in a, in a time that uh, uh, is not very kind to scientific expertise. There are large subsets of the population that uh, question general scientific consensus uh, when it suits their, their, mean, or their, their goals. And uh, it's a difficult path to walk and it's, it's really hard to have all manner of, of expertise and um, basically have to see it be politicized. So, so these are some very um, large hurdles uh, to, to getting involved in this field. And it uh, requires a bit of, of thought before you, you keep going. However, there are some positive sides to it. Um, the first is that it, it's challenging. I, and I can't speak from experience on everything, but my understanding is that you can get used to a lot of different things, uh, no matter how cool you might think they are at first. And, and really what it comes down to is, uh, are you working on complicated problems that mean something to you with people that you enjoy working with? And you guys are in a fisheries class, so an example of that would be, uh, there's a lot more people on the planet. It's gonna, the population is going to continue growing for, for some time and people like to eat seafood. So how are we going to manage that demand for food while also 
uh, caring for the ecosystems that support them. So you do get to work on these very meaningful, challenging problems. Uh, and if you're fortunate, you also have a, a host of, of wonderful coworkers that you get to tackle them with. Um, also, you get to work outside, which has never really been as important to me as it has in the last few weeks when I couldn't go outside. Uh, so it's, it's nice to be able to go outside and, and see firsthand, touch and, and feel the, uh, the ecosystems that you're working in. Um, and then just as a minor example, the ocean is a crazy place. Uh, and so you're gonna get all manner of fun cocktail stories, cocktail party stories. Uh, for example, this, this picture here is of, uh, perhaps some of you know, it's, it's a torpedo ray, which is a stingray that can generate electricity. It's powerful enough that uh, it is on the lines of an AED. So if you were to touch it, uh, it could certainly uh, stop your heart. Uh, and, and this one uh, here was seen off of Cortez Bank, which is about 100 miles off the coast of California. Uh, and they're very curious, I'll say, so they will sometimes swim towards you very slowly and there's not much you can do. So it's just a crazy place to get to work um, and, and it's kind of fun to get to experience it. Uh, for those of you that don't know, that there's, there's, I would say, three kind of mainstream paths to work in this field, but there, there's kind of nuance to each one and, and uh, middle ground. Uh, the first is academia, which is your research positions, uh, professorship uh, in universities. And for that, you need to get your undergraduate degree, get really great grades, go to graduate school, uh, get really great grades, publish a whole bunch of papers, uh, do the same thing in your postdoc, uh, and then slowly beg, barter your way into an assistant professorship job where for seven years you are trying to bring in as many millions of dollars in grant money and publish as many papers as you can, then maybe one day you'll get tenure. Um, so that's, uh, that's the academic side. The other is nonprofit where you'll still need your undergraduate degree. Uh, but to get involved in this field, it's, it's often better to spend time volunteering and getting internships, particularly in the organization that you're uh, interested in working for, because oftentimes they will hire from within. And, and when they see a, a volunteer, an intern who's done a great job, uh, they like to bring them on. And the final side is, is policy, where you get to work on developing and implementing the uh, policies that can have a benefit to marine resources and still need an undergraduate and a master's or a PhD is, is uh, often helpful as well. And there you need to spend time, maybe not so much in the field, but interning in uh, some of the government agencies, whether it's the Army Corps of Engineers, NOAA Fisheries, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, getting a handle on what the different policies are that can affect um, marine resources. So specifically how how I went about this. Uh, I started out, I grew up in Baltimore, uh, left high school, went to University of Miami, which is, as Dave was mentioning right before this talk, I, I like to consider something of a, a uh, sister school with, with USC. That's right, Dave. It, it, it looks great. <laughs> uh, it, they're, they're both private institutions. They both um, have a bit of a smaller student body than people think. Um, they're full of pretty people and have wonderful academics. Um, so spent four years there. Uh, and in that time, uh, I did summer internships at the National Aquarium, working on seahorse breeding, uh, intertidal ecology at Shoals Marine Lab in the Gulf of Maine, and then uh, snapping turtle ecotoxicology in uh, the Solomons, Maryland at Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. Uh, finishing that, I went and got my master's at Florida International University, uh, working on fish movement in the Everglades. Uh, and for any of you that are thinking about working in the Everglades one day. Just a, a word of warning from someone who's worked in uh, most quarters of this country, the Everglades is by far the most not fun environment that I've worked in. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, it's hot and it's even hotter in the vegetation um, at night. The mosquitoes are insane um, and there's spiders everywhere. It's just, it's really not fun. There's thunderstorms every afternoon. So after Three years there, I uh, moved to the West Coast with my then girlfriend, now wife, and got a position at NOAA Fisheries, uh, where I worked primarily on policy and eelgrass work, where I met Dave. Um, and while I was there, started working a bit more on abalone recovery and rockfish up in Puget Sound, um, which diversified me a little bit. And then 
uh, seven years at, after starting that position uh, that concluded and I moved on to my current role at Power Marine Research Group and also a, a mm -hmm. smaller field role at Occidental College with the Vantina Research Group. And I find that sometimes when people give talks about their path, it's, it's easy to gloss over certain things uh, that it, they maybe take a really difficult, complex experience and make it sound like, oh, you know, I took an interest in politics and now I'm senator or something. Uh, so that's, at least for me, that's, that's not necessarily been the case. Um, and I want to try and walk a fine line with this to make it sound like I'm not you know, bitter or, or angry or something. But after seven years of working at NOAA as a contractor, um, an opportunity for a federal position, which was which is basically a tenured uh, situation in the federal government, came available written for my exact job. And uh, the way it was written, only the scoring system for candidates basically gave major preference to military veterans. And so a military veteran with zero experience uh, and no graduate degree was hired and I lost my job. Uh, and that was extremely hurtful and, and frustrating, but because I was spent the time while I was there uh, meeting people working on things like abalone and rockfish, I was able to uh, maintain a, a strong network and transitioned into a new job very quickly. So uh, what maybe seemed like a very bad situation at first kind of worked out in my advantage. Um, but it, so when might think oh, it was a straight line, but in, in fact, there are, are peaks and valleys and, and backwards and forwards. So uh, if, if you find yourself in, in a tough spot like that, uh, I think it's way more common than, than folks think. So because you're college students and you've been getting insane amounts of advice for likely the last five or six or more years, uh, if I had to distill my advice for this kind of work, it would be in, in three parts. The first would be uh, you, Getting good grades is kind of the start of what makes you appealing to a graduate advisor or a job. I would try and find something else that can make you attractive to an employer or a graduate advisor. Some suggestions would be uh, competence with statistical software like R um, or understanding spatial database work in, in GIS uh, or becoming uh, a scientific diver. I found that when I became a scientific diver two years after starting with NOAA, I, that's when I really started meeting a lot of people and, and forming a lot of relationships. Uh, I worked at, or I volunteered as a scientific diver at the California Science Center right next door to you guys. And I met uh, someone that works in the Banatuna Research Group at Occidental College, and I'm still good friends with her today. Um, and I, I feel like that was a fairly foundational relationship that was just basically total luck starting at a volunteer dive position. So you never know what can kind of come out of um, these different areas. The other, if I can channel my early 2000s pop culture with a, a screenshot from The Wire, it is to uh, look at your career with, with soft eyes. And that, that means don't get too fixated on a single species or problem because there may be very limited opportunities. Uh, if, if you're someone who's always wanted to work on sharks or stingrays or whales, that, that's great. And, and you might even be able to get a graduate position in uh, work, working on one of those um, very charismatic critters, but there's only so many jobs out there. And if you really specialize in your training, you might specialize yourself out of a job. Uh, I know as many people who now work as lawyers and yoga instructors that got graduate degrees in whales and sharks as I do, who actually got jobs working on whales and sharks. And finally, as I was mentioning about the diving, uh, your network is extremely important. Uh, and your network is basically everybody that you can consider a colleague, and that's your classmates, your professors, uh, people who advise you in internships, anybody. Um, their success is your success, so do your best to help them out where you can. Life is long and strange. You never know uh, where people might be able to help you out. So keep in touch with people and uh, be as supportive as you can. All right, so now we got through the, the whole career part. Um, and, and you can see that if you want to stumble through things like I did and, and end up counting stuff underwater for a living, um, 
let's talk about abalone. But before we do that, uh, I want to go over three terms uh, with you guys so that we, uh, we are on the same page. The first is an Lee effect. Um, does anybody know what an Lee effect is? Dave told me to wait an uncomfortably long time until someone responds, so I can I can do this for a long. I'm quarantined. Just isn't it to do with like a population fitness? That's all I know. <laughs> I don't know if, if fitness is the exact right word, but it it definitely has to do with with population uh, stability and, and growth. Um, so an Lee effect is, is what happens when uh, a population has too few animals or individuals in it to reproduce effectively. Think about, um, uh, you know, a, a, say a reduced population of, of fish and there's five fish in the ocean and the fish can't find each other to reproduce. Um, that's an, and then the population declines. That's an Lee effect. So in the top figure, you'll see a really strong Lee effect where you, when you have a small population uh, designated as the left side of the x-axis, the population actually declines. And only after you get over a certain hump in um, individuals in the population, then can the population grow. Uh, in the middle plot, you'll see the population won't decline, but it will take a longer time to increase at lower population levels. And then in the absence of an Lee effect, uh, there is no effect of population density on, on growth rates. Does that make sense? Yeah. Basically, you, you need enough individuals in a population to effectively breed. Mm -hmm. The next is, is a term called serial depletion, uh, which is where when you have a number of related species in a fishery, uh, occasionally a fishery will target one first and then move to a second, move to a third, and one step. And they move to the different species as um, stocks of the targeted in, uh, species become depleted. So if species A is either the easiest to catch or the most uh, profitable, that will be targeted first. But as that declines, the fishery will move on to a new species and, and in, doing, in so doing, uh, having a, a much larger effect on the ecosystem. And the third is a just very dipping your toe in the water of population biology. Um, I imagine that you, you all have at least seen the logistic growth curve in population growth where um, the uh, population at low levels might increase at an exponential rate when there's no limitation of resources, whether it's space or food. Um, but as the population grows and reaches a carrying capacity denoted by K across the top where the area cannot sustain any more individuals, the population growth, uh, population size levels off. And the, there is an equation, of course, to model the, the change in population over time. And it's, you don't need to worry about solving the equation or anything. It's important to note, though, that uh, the terms K and R are extremely important in dictating how many individuals there are and K being the carrying capacity, R being the, the growth rate, which would be calculated as births, births minus deaths and immigration minus emigration. Uh, and, and so if you have those numbers, you can calculate things like your maximum sustainable yield, which is how many individuals you can remove from the population without affecting the growth. And that's, that's noted by X here on the plot. But there's a problem. Oftentimes, these are data poor uh, populations. And so it's really difficult to actually know what K and R are. In, in fact, those numbers, particularly K, can change with time naturally, let alone with uh, human influences. So uh, oftentimes uh, when you see a, a um, crash in a species, it's, it's because either there's no management or the management is not working with appropriate values of these parameters. And so keep these in mind. I'll try, I'll try and, and call them out as we go through the, the story of abalone. Okay, so for those of you who don't know what abalone are, uh, abalone are basically giant snails. They're gastropod mollusks. They either hang out um, 
on top of rocks or in crevices in relatively shallow rocky reef habitats. They wait for drift algae to float by so they can snare and eat it. Um, we don't know that much about how much they move, but we have placed time, ca uh, time lapse cameras on certain individuals for months and months and had the animal move no more than uh, a few inches back and forth. So at least some of them don't move a lot. Uh, the broadcast spawners, which means they release their gametes into the water where they will hopefully mix with the opposite gamete and uh, settle out. Uh, they have a lot of natural predators, particularly when they're uh, younger, include octopus, lobster, otters, which aren't as much of a problem down here, uh, sheephead, and sun stars, which sadly are not a problem basically anywhere now because they're long dead. In Southern California, we have seven species of abalone, <laughs> and none of them are doing terribly well, uh, except for flat abalone, which uh, nobody really knows. Uh, but green and pink and pinto abalone are all species of concern, which means they're kind of being watched for possible listing under the Endangered Species Act, where black abalone and white abalone are listed under the Endangered Species Act. And, and of those two, the, the black abalone is doing a bit better. They're, they live in the intertidal area. They're doing a bit better than, than white abalone are. In white abalone, they, they're often found uh, 50 feet down to like 200. And abalone in general, oh, question. Yeah, thank you for undermining my comment, Dave, about the green abalone not doing well. <laughs> uh, so um, abalone throughout history have had great cultural importance, not just recently uh, you can find or people have found uh, shell fragments uh, as far east as Texas uh, through trade uh, with Native American people, um, suggesting they had a, a good deal of value. Uh, I think this, this image on the left is a shell midden from uh, one of the Channel Islands where there are just stacks and stacks of shells that have been piled up uh, after they were harvested. And it, it's extra difficult uh, <laughs> to look at this picture now because I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the two shells that you can see pretty clearly, this one in this one, they, they are definitely white abalone. And, and so just seeing the, the <laughs> white abalone just carelessly har harvested and tossed aside is, is pretty, pretty brutal to see. Um, so I've been told, uh, since I didn't grow up here, but I've been told that the, the abalone had such cultural importance in California throughout the, the 20th century, people collecting them recreationally uh, and, and having big cookouts, it'd be the same thing as uh, salmon in Washington or lobster in New England, and of course, most importantly, blue crab in Maryland. But fishing pressure has been pretty intense for a long time. Uh, you can see these folks here from Santa Barbara in the early 20th century probably were not considering what the R and the K were for abalone. They probably just saw stacks and stacks and stacks of uh, of abalone there for the taking um, and uh, thought it was an inexhaustible resource, which is, uh, was not true. And the data bore that out. Um, well, early in the fishery, you can see that there was not too much value because there were so many abalone. The laws of supply and demand eventually kicked in and the landings decreased as people were harvesting more and more. The value went way up, which of course is a great recipe for people to spend a lot of effort collecting whatever's left until the 90s when the um, fishery has, was officially declared collapsed and there no more commercial fishing was allowed. Recreational fishing was allowed for some time afterwards. Uh, and the last recreational fish for abalone, which was uh, north of San Francisco, for red abalone uh, was closed a couple years ago thanks to uh, some kelp die-offs. So there, there is zero, zero excuse for, for taking any abalone in California now because you can't say it's legal anywhere. And this, the, the harvest didn't occur on all species uniformly. Um, it started out heavily on the red and the pink abalone and then as those species declined, uh, which of course is quite consistent with the cereal depletion 
concept that we talked about earlier, uh, then moved on to green, black, and white abalone. Uh, my guess is that black abalone were not targeted as much because I've, I've heard the tissue is not very good to eat. Uh, so even though they're intertidal and probably were pretty easy to, to get, um, probably didn't taste as good as some of the other ones that were available through uh, probably simple snorkeling. Um, and the white abalone, this is really a bummer that we don't have better data, but there looks like there wasn't much harvest of white abalone, but it can be pretty easy for someone who isn't familiar with identification to mistake white abalone and pink abalone. So uh, there's a pretty strong suspicion that many of the pink abalone here may actually have been white abalone uh, instead. In addition to the, the heavy fishing, um, a disease was found in Southern California in the mid 80s called withering syndrome. Withering syndrome affects the muscle on the abalone's foot, which uh, is required to connect to the rock. If abalone are not uh, very strongly attached to their, their rock, um, they are vulnerable to predation. And so if they can't attach, they're just gonna tumble around and get eaten very, very quickly. And so in addition to the fishing, um, this disease had pretty dramatic effects on um, all of the abalone in Southern California. And uh, I think that there is some immunity being uh, found in the species now, which, which is great, but it will take a little while to, for the species to recover. And uh, it, that is if there are enough numbers for them to get together and successfully broadcast on. So this is, this is all very depressing um, as, as many of these, these talks start out. Um, continues the uh, um, uh, white abalone surveys that take place out of Cortez and Tanner Bank, which are pretty undisturbed, not perfectly undisturbed, but they're very wild and very far from shore. So you need to spend a lot of resources to get there. And so folks have been doing ROV surveys out there um, for the last 15, 20 years. And even out there, they're seeing um, substantial declines in white abalone abundance. So just about everywhere, um, things have not been going well for, for abalone and, and particularly white abalone, which is terrible, which is why just really quickly before we go on, uh, this is a picture of Keanu Reeves riding my dog like a horse. Uh, and, and sometimes we just need to take a minute and, and, and look at a dog and, and relax. Um, collect ourselves before we can go forward. It's, it's really the, the only way I found uh, to uh, handle some of these intractable problems um, and, and, and keep being functional. Okay, so what happens when you have particularly a, a single species that, that's not doing well? Uh, and, and that is that they are listed under the Endangered Species Act, which I imagine you guys are familiar with what the ESA is, but perhaps not specifically how it works um, and, and what the ramifications of listing a species under the ESA are. So the way you list a species is that you petition the federal government with some amount of evidence and say, hey, uh, basically I used to catch white abalone all the time and I don't catch white abalone anymore. Here's a bunch of surveys that show we don't find any white abalone. Uh, would you please review this and consider listing under the Endangered Species Act? Uh, and that gets submitted either to NOAA or the um, US, and Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they will convene a team to review your data, determine if it's worth further pursuing the petition. If your data is sufficient, they will then undergo a longer term analysis period uh, in which they make a final determination whether or not the species should be listed. Um, that happened with white abalone in the early 2000s. Uh, and it was found to be in serious trouble, so they were listed as uh, endangered under the federal ESA. So once the species is listed as endangered, um, a couple of things happen. The first is that any projects, any activity that's um, permitted, permitted, funded, or carried out by the federal government, which is basically everything um, that might affect the species, uh, undergoes a pretty serious uh, consultation process. So there is a lower likelihood of any 
developmental impacts on white abalone, which white abalone, they're, they're found pretty deep um, in, in offshore. So that's, that's not a huge deal for them. Uh, what is more important is the, the recovery plan that is uh, assembled by experts in the species where they basically outline their blueprint for how to bring the species back. Is intervention required? What are the steps that we need to take to ensure the species can return to a self-sustaining population? And in this recovery plan, they ran some modeling exercises. Um, and of course, uh, every model needs to be taken with a grain of salt and, and keep in mind that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And uh, this modeling exercise showed that without any intervention, uh, the white abalone are going to go extinct very, very quickly. Um, and with the greater the intervention, the greater the likelihood that the white abalone will uh, survive. So what does intervention look like for the white abalone? Well, in short, basically you're gonna have to add a lot of white abalone to the, to the subtitle habitat. That's because there just aren't enough of them out there to reproduce effectively without knowing that they form mating aggregations. If you have a, only a couple individuals per hectare in a good area, then the odds that they will find each other and release their gametes right next door uh, are pretty low. So we need to find white abalone, bring them into the lab, uh, induce them to spawn. And while that's, go while that's going on, and we are creating a bunch of little white abalone to return to the ocean, we need to figure out how to return them to the ocean effectively, where we should do so, and then come up with some long-term monitoring approaches uh, in order to determine whether or not we need to make any changes. And if so, we can have a whole bunch of outplant activities and slowly, painfully uh, return abalone to a sustainable population. So where are we now with this? Well, the first part that we've been doing, I've been involved in this since 2011, is doing habitat preference surveys. And I really just, I need you all to understand how many surveys we've done uh, down in La Jolla, Point Loma, out at uh, a number of the Channel Islands, particularly San Nicolas and San Clemente. And it's, it's difficult to determine what the best habitat characteristics are for white abalone when you just don't see a lot. You need to infer things from a very small sample size, and, and that can be dangerous. Uh, and so here's a, a brief summary of, of what we're, we're learning so far. The first is that uh, they prefer low relief habitats. So a, uh, a rocky reef with less than a meter of um, relief around it, which is uh, at least uh, for a general diver, uh, kind of counterintuitive because oftentimes when we associate healthy reefs with these very high relief structures with a lot of fish, um, it, and that's just not true. Oftentimes, if you're swimming in good white abalone habitat, you might think, well, this is not the most interesting dive I've ever done. Um, the next is, is sand channels, and, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Um, little areas along the reef that are scoured out and have collections of sand, and it, it's not the sand uh, itself that's good for the white abalone. It's, um, if sand is moving through there, so too is detrital algae, and that's the preferred food uh, of the white abalone. So they're, they're closer to a food source. And along those lines, uh, presence of the macroalgae growing on the reef, of course, would be a source of the food. And in particular, the algae they seem to be associated with is Macrocystis agarum in the Laminaria. area. Um, the rock type uh, they like is tends to be a bit smoother. It's, uh, we haven't necessarily quantified uh, the rock type itself, but when you see a smooth rock, you know it's a smooth rock, and you see really pocked up rough rock, you know it's not as good. Um, and then finally, the, the depth zone, and interestingly, that's actually uh, decreased a little bit. Uh, I think people used to think, oh, if you want to see white abalone, you need to go to 80 feet, and, and we've seen them actually fairly consistently at 50 and 60 feet, and in one extraordinarily bizarre case, in 15 feet inside the breakwater at the Port of Long Beach. Uh, that just didn't make any sense at all, um, but there it was. Um, 
and, and I think that this really highlights the importance of getting out there and, and putting your head in the water. Um, some folks at Scripps, including me at Tegna, put together a study, I think in the 90s, saying that wet abalone were so reduced that there were only you know, a, a half dozen in, in all of uh, the San Diego area. Um, don't quote me on that, but it was, it was extremely low. And some colleagues of mine starting in 2010, 2011, in an effort that I was involved in, started just going out to Point Loma and La Jolla and doing surveys, just looking for wet abalone. And in so doing, they found uh, way more than were expected and also helped influence these habitat characteristics. So uh, it is extremely important to get out and just give a look sometimes, particularly in uh, data limited uh, species. And to give you an idea of what some of our surveys look like, this is a video taken at San Clemente Island a couple of years ago, uh, where a group of us are doing some transects. I don't know if that video looked as terrible for you as it did for me, but um, uh, hopefully you can see there's a lot of macroalgae. Uh, the relief doesn't look very high, and so we determined this would be a place to see if we can find any uh, white abalone. And, and sadly, on this entire trip, uh, we covered uh, dozens of acres of habitat. We didn't see a single live white abalone, um, likely because San Clemente was at one point the focus of the, the fishery. Moving on to outplanting, we, we need to determine a sound way to place these animals out in the environment on the reef so that they can effectively move from the lab out into a, uh, their natural habitat with the least amount of mortality. And so uh, some of my colleagues uh, built these short-term abalone fixed enclosures or SAFEs. Uh, and they're, they're the two modules you see depicted right here. Um, they are PVC frames wrapped with, with wire, uh, allowing for some water to flow through, but excluding most predators. And I, I, I italicized most here because you're basically never going to keep octopus out of anything that they want to get into. So it is a fool's errand to waste your time trying to keep octopus out. So um, may as well just let whatever's going to happen with the octopus happen. Um, and so we place the animals in there for four to five weeks. We feed them once. Uh, and then we are able to prop open, I can see my corner here, but we can prop open this, the PVC frame here uh, and let the abalone come out very, can I see a question? Yes, so we actually have had, we did a, a separate study using a prototype of these years ago um, where we were doing a withering syndrome study, placing uh, uh, some juvenile red abalone in these, and they were out uh, on some sandy bottom in uh, Santa Barbara and off uh, Newport. And when we went and recovered them, there were uh, <laughs> there were octopus in every single one. Interestingly, not a huge amount of mortality. So. I don't know if the octopus got its fill or just like the structure or what, but it wasn't as bad of mortality as we would have expected. Um, so that's a good question. And there are a few people who are very dedicated to that very question. And the best way we can get at um, that predation is looking at shells, particularly, uh, is there an octopus drill hole in the middle of the shell when we collect it? Um, and so it, it definitely happens um, and little abalone, whether they're raised in a lab or um, uh, naturally settled, there's going to be a lot of mortality in the early life stage, uh, oftentimes from predation. I don't think, purely a guess here, I don't think that octopus are our biggest problem, it, particularly in our San Diego outplant site. I, I think it's probably sheephead. Um, but I, 
in a best case scenario, if we outplant 1,500 animals and, and we see 10 in five years, that's going to be pretty tremendous success. So um, there is going to be some predation. There's just not much we can do about it. We just, uh, some of the other, one of the other outplant approaches involved uh, putting the animals in a PVC tube and opening the tube after 24 hours. And there are some, we have time-lapse video showing that lobster and octopus basically just went to the mouth of those PVC tubes and, and went hog wild. So we built the safes more or less to um, allow a slower emigration of abalone from safe habitat to the, to the reef. And, and you can see in this picture, we placed the safes right around um, some boulder habitat that is um, more heavily structured that they can get to a safer refuge as quickly as possible. And also the bottom of the safe, this concrete uh, piece is concave. So the abalone can actually crawl under it and get some shelter for as long as they need and until they get so hungry that they need to, they need to crawl out. Um, so so the, that's the safe. Uh, we put about 40 to 50 abalone in there. Um, in, in each safe and we put maybe 20 safes out uh, at, at a given site. Um, it's nice because they're relatively inexpensive and they're not that big. So maneuvering them underwater while a pain is not, uh, it, it doesn't become say like a working dive where you've got to uh, lift, you know, hundreds of pounds of um, cobble uh, to, to move around your module. That, that gets very dangerous very quickly. Um, so, this is, this is what we've been, been using thus far. Um, and this is a, a view of, of what they look like um, placed at our Point Loma outplant site. This is a photo mosaic of about 40 or 50 pictures I stitched together um, from Point Loma. If you feet at the bottom, all these little white and green things are our safe modules. Um, and they're arranged in this array. Uh, if you're wondering why we arranged them like that, um, I think the shorter answer is that we found some really promising habitat around here, some good boulders that the animals could crawl out to. Uh, this is our second outplant. Our first one, we actually moved this way and there was less promising habitat. So we moved them here for our second outplant. And around here, it's a bit deeper. It's about 75 feet of water up here. Uh, it's close to about 65. So we've done two outplants with red abalone, one in the winter of 2018 and one in the spring of 2019. Uh, the winter was our first try and we, we knew that we were going to be uh, learning a lot by, by doing it. And that's why we used farm raised red abalone uh, to basically get a proof of concept before we moved on to endangered white abalone. And the winter 2018 outplant was exactly that. We had some huge swells roll through and, and jumble our safes about. Uh, and so in between 2018 and 2019, we redesigned the SAFE modules, um, both to what they're comprised of. Um, we took that black mesh and made it much thinner so they don't get carried around uh, by the swell quite so much. And also connected them, every SAFE, to a lead line throughout the site. So if one SAFE were to move, all the SAFEs have to move. Um, and so the spring outplant uh, in 2019 went far more smoothly. And with those, uh, those data and, and feeling much more confident, uh, we moved on to our first white abalone outplant in fall 2019. Uh, we've done a good bit of monitoring already. We are seeing some returns. This is a outplanted uh, white abalone at Palos Verdes. This was uh, under a rock that I had flipped over, um, which is the, one of the best ways to find them. Uh, so we will be continuing these wet abalone outplants for the foreseeable future. I, I think for the, the animals, the species to be really uh, restored to a standing level, it's going to require uh, basically an industrial level outplant uh, effort where um, tens or hundreds of thousands are placed out multiple times a year at multiple sites, um, not just what we're doing right now, which is basically 1,500 and in San Diego and, and 1500 in um, uh, Palos Verdes. So that's where we are right now. And, and 
to, to kind of wrap that up and, and bring it back to fisheries, um, uh, fish, fishery stocks with reductions in R and K uh, are going to lead to population crashes. And if you don't have sufficient data to estimate those values and you make poor assumptions, uh, it's going to have a, a bad effect on the fishery. Uh, and this third point was actually from the rockfish part of the uh, uh, presentation that I didn't give today. But uh, you can put a lot of great rec recovery activities uh, and restrictions into place and you may not see any changes right away. And that's because uh, your recovery is going to occur on time steps commensurate with R, which basically means if you've got a species that takes a long time to reproduce um, to reach sexual maturity and doesn't have successful reproduction every year, it's going to take decades to see any kind of success. Um, and then, and then finally, just note that there, there are a lot of passionate and, and capable people working on, on recovery of, of abalone. Um, so while it is daunting um, at times, uh, there, there are a lot of really great people working on it. Um, and I think that's my last slide. So unless you have a question of what would it look like if Patrick Swayze wrestled an octopus, um, I'd be happy to try and answer it. <laughs> Adam, what do you think the, uh, what was your success rate on finding, because I remember talking to you about this, but uh, on the white abs, how many did you find uh, typically, you know, if you put out a certain number, I mean, it was a pretty low rate of return, wasn't it? But I guess in some ways you don't always know if they're hiding or you found some empty shells, but that didn't account for all the ones you put out there. Is that right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because uh, finding the live ones is, both good and bad. You want to find the live ones because it is some metric of this is what we put out and this is what we found, but it also means they may not be hiding as well as they could be. And if we could find them so easily, then it, there's a good chance that uh, predators might be able to as well. Um, folks up in Puget Sound have outplanted pinto abalone for uh, some time and they found that it took five to six years for them to see returns of emergent um, abalone that they had outplanted. So the monitoring for this work uh, will continue for five or six years and, and hopefully then we're going to see some more emergent larger outplants and the um, we know the genetics of all of their parents and so you can sample an abalone genetically by just taking a little clip of its epipodium, uh, which the uh, epipodium is this little, these little tentacles right here. If you just take one of those with a pair of forceps, um, you can figure out its, uh, its lineage and we can uh, determine basically what, what outplant it was a part of. So um, in that time, we'll be able to, to measure success, hopefully much more uh, completely. Um, for, for how many live ones we're seeing, uh, we're seeing right now, um, 40 or 50 for a monitoring period and that's for putting 1500 out um, in, in Point Loma. And, and that's not, super invasive sampling. So I would, I would say it's going pretty well. Um, oftentimes the, the shells can be a better measure of success. If you, in our uh, winter 2018 outplant of red abalone, we saw a huge amount of shells right away. Um, I, 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 we're not at a point that I should be sharing any of those data, uh, but the, the amount of shells in winter 2018, um, it was, way higher than the spring 2019. So it's moving in the right direction. That seems to be expected though. I mean, you can't expect all of them to survive and there's a lot of physical conditions. I mean, I, well, something that strikes me is uh, working off Catalina is that I can remember, uh, you know, in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, you would never see abalone at, at Catalina. And it wasn't really until, uh, I don't know, at least in the early, you know, 2011, 2012, you started to see some, and now it's pretty common to see abalone in, off Catalina, but it took years and years, and 
you know, sometimes you see quite a few now and it's, it's pretty surprising to see how long, you know, to kind of realize how long it's taken kind of thinking back, Oh geez, I never saw them. <laughs> yeah. That, that blue cavern MPA right next to Wrigley is in the shallows, like 15 or 20 feet of water. I've never seen more abalone in my life than diving there. Yeah. Uh, last fall. Yeah. So the, the the greens in particular, but also the pinks seem to be doing pretty well off Catalina. Um, and we wouldn't have known that there were whites <laughs> so close by, um, but there we found two or three white abalone off of Ship Rock. Uh, oh, that's cool. Four or five years ago. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if down the line, the kind of bird rock, ship rock area is considered for outplanting, but um, yeah. That's, that's got some, some strong currents. I don't know how much I want to work there. Charles, or Charlie, I know you like to, um, you like to free dive and, and, you know, hunt. Do you ever see abalone when you go out off Orange County? I actually do decently often. I don't, I'm not sure what species they are, but in like Crystal Cove area. Um, yeah. Cause it's, it's like, like you were talking about with pretty low relief. A lot of the reef there is like relatively flat. And I've seen a lot of abalone. I always want to take the shells, but I can't take, because there's like a lot of abalone shells too, but I, yeah. I can't take the shells. You can't um, take anything from there, right? Well, I, you can fish, you can spear fish and catch fin fish and lobster in Crystal Cove State Park, but nothing else. Right. I've had that thought before, collect if I collect abalone shells from our work in Point Loma or something and leave them in my BC or, or dry suit and then I'm somewhere else and I think oh god what if someone stops me and says where'd you get that shell <laughs> yeah yeah because no, they're beautiful I mean they're like a really beautiful animal I have never personally caught them but I had like friends who dove for them before the band went into place in what 2019 for recreational that diving. Red abalone up north, yeah. Um, so I, like, I've tasted it and it's delicious, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, they're like a really impressive creature. I've seen them a lot off Catalina too. Like just, I guess that would be north of Two Harbors diving there. Yeah. I was looking back in the... Uh... Uh, you know, the black abalone were never very common off Catalina, but the last, I've been putting together a species list for the area off, uh, off where the Marine Lab is in Two Harbors on the West End. And uh, there hasn't been a report of a black abalone there, at least in the literature, in the scientific literature or any reports for the last, since like 1981 or 8080, at least that I know of, um, right off the lab. So they used to be there, but they haven't found one since. So um, yeah, so in some cases, I think you just, you know, maybe you're not going to be able to restore some abalone, but it's really interesting with these whites that, that, uh, that they're, they're doing okay. And I, I think that's really encouraging to see. So it's pretty neat. So, well, Adam, I, I want to thank you for your lecture today. Um, really appreciate it learn something new. Uh, interesting that octopus can get into those safes. It's, you know, and I think about the, the, the mesh that you're using. I mean, it's like, you know, maybe an inch. And I know octopus are pretty, uh, I mean, there are different size octopus, but pretty amazing. They can get themselves in there, eat a meal, and then, <laughs> you know, and then get out. They, it's true though. Those are, they're really amazing animals. Uh, and I guess thinking about some of their burrows, uh, they have, their burrows are pretty small, so I guess they can get in and out. But anyways, I wanted to thank you for today. And um, I know I'll be talking to you soon, but if any of you guys have questions that you think of afterwards or things we can talk about them in our next session, or if you have anything, if, if you're interested in getting in touch with Adam, uh, I can forward his, his contact information to you. Um, but we will meet again next week and I'll post information on Blackboard about uh, Tuesday's lecture and I'll have everything graded and all that information for you uh, by then I promise guaranteed and uh, thanks Adam really appreciate your time sure. today sure happy to do it all right awesome thank you bye guys right, sure. thank bye. you
Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.